Thank you very much for coming to this session today. Uh, my name is Damien Murphy from Corelight. I'm um, going to be talking today about uh, an area that Gartner called NTA, Network Traffic Analysis. So an interesting area of cybersecurity that's very much at the fore, but actually there's a lot of history behind um, the solution I'm going to talk about today. Um, question for the audience. Has anybody heard of Bro before? The Bro Security Monitor? Okay, very, okay, about two people in the audience. Okay, that's good. I won't be telling you lots of boring stuff then, so if this is new to everybody, that's good. Um, so the interesting story behind Bro, so by the way, terrible name, I have to excuse. So the name Bro has been uh, changed by committee to Zeek, so you will see a lot of stuff being rebranded as Zeek, but it is known over the last 23 years as Bro, and the reason it was called Bro is because our founder, or the founder of uh, the solution, Bro, Vern Paxson, or Dr. Vern Paxson, uh, it's actually based upon uh, Big Brother, so 1984 and Big Brother's watching. So with um, uh, you know, ult ultimate power comes ultimate responsibility. So basically the message is that if you can look at all traffic on a network, you need to be the good guy. So luckily we are the good guys. So this started out back in, in 1995 in Lawrence Berkeley Labs. So there was a number of people, kind of cool dudes hanging out there. Um, so if you've ever heard of Van Jacobsen, uh, he's the godfather of TCP. So the reason why uh, watching Netflix or YouTube, the internet does not implode is because of congestion control that was brought into TCP uh, by Van Jacobson and team. So he, Vern Paxson, and another gentleman called Dr. Stephen McCann were all hanging out together in Lawrence Berkeley Labs back in the 90s. Uh, Dr. Steve McCann went off and built a packet capturing thing called TCP dump, which I'm sure some people here would have heard about, uh, which then kind of went on to become Wireshark. So he was looking at packets very much around network analysis, um, figuring out problems, performance problems, that view. Vern Paxson, however, was looking at it from a, can I use all that packet data and actually do security analytics? And the reason that he was looking at this, you know, cybersecurity was not a big thing per se back in 1995. But it turns out that LBL was actually a massive target for um, IP theft because LBL, like a lot of universities, does industry research. There's actually 100 Nobel Prizes that have, of science prizes that have been awarded to people at LBL for research. So that, that data is rich data for attackers to try and, and, and grab. So Vern Paxson was building a solution to be able to look at wire data, analyze it, generate security logs, uh, and also a very interesting part of it, which is um, scripting and be able to do some, some interesting stuff. So uh, this product that is kind of new has actually been around for 23 years. So um, it's an open source uh, project, so under BSD license, so freely available, the open source uh, via GitHub. Uh, lots of customers running, and I'll tell you some stories about customers running um, open source Bro. And then the other side of it is the commercial side. So I work for a company called Corelight. It's actually got all of the founders who built open source Bro, all the core contributors are Corelight employees. Uh, and we actually support the open source project, and I'll talk about that in a minute. So um, I think all of us know that um, the current US administration is not so down with science, I would say. So the traditional funding for the project had come from the National Science Foundation. So the NSF in the US um, has been supporting since back in the 90s the development of Bro. The reason is it was critical for cybersecurity for the US government. So for agencies like Department of Energy, which are not involved in actually generating energy, they look after the nuclear stockpile um, in the US. So it's kind of important that uh, the US um, command and control system is not taken over by foreign actors. So Bro has been a core part of that. So interestingly, in 2016, 2017, the budget sub submission by NSF to, the, to Congress, number one line item, the number one top was Bro, uh, continued funding for Bro. Number two was the search for gravitational waves. So um, it's seen as pretty important. However, the funding has dried up. There is no more government funding for Bro. So we core light the commercial side of um, an enterprise version of Bro. We support the open source community and continue to do so. So a question comes up sometimes, are you, you know, bad corporate citizens? Are you going to only develop stuff that goes into the enterprise version and not release it back into GitHub? No. So everything that we do uh, and our guys are developing, guys and girls are developing, uh, we release back into the open source community. And then the commercial side is for large organizations who don't want to deal with the headache of implementing implementing Open Source Pro, and obviously I'll have to come to that. So, a bit of a story. Lots of customers, so I think two or three hands said they were aware of, of Bro. Um, 
very large in the research community and large organizations like Amazon and others, they run Open Source Bro. A number of them are commercial Corelight customers. I can't name them by name, but eight of the Fortune 50 companies are actually Corelight customers. They've moved from open source across, across to commercial um, uh, implementation of Bro slash Zeek. Uh, an interesting local customer is the southern region of Denmark, and they're doing Bro at scale. I was actually having a chat with the gent who looks after this deployment. He has got 616 processor cores um, running Bro. He is generating between 50 to 70 terabytes, not gigs, terabytes of data, and I'll talk about what the data is, per day, and pushing it into um, a solution, which is the Humio engine, which I'm going to be demoing, so into a back end. So they have about 30,000 users. They're taking um, the, the wireline data from large hospitals, psychiatric facilities, looking at all that traffic going east-west and north-south, looking for malware, looking for phishing attacks, looking for data exfiltration. So all the good stuff I'm going to talk about and do a demo on. Um, and that's being done at scale. So this, by the way, in terms of referencing who these customers are, this comes from the open source community. So there's a, there's a it used to be called Brocon. Thanks for that name is going away. Zeek. So Zeek Week next, next year, it'll be called. The, these are the companies, yeah, well, it's good because Zeek, Geek, you know, there's all kinds of things we can do with that name. Seek, well, it actually does come from Seek. The, the, pros, the reason it came back from the 1990s, um, the user ID under Unix that was actually run, that ran the bro processes was actually called Zeek because of Zeek and you shall find. So this is all um, from the Zeek slash bro mailing lists and from Brocon. These are people who talk about their use of bro um, so it's not me sharing anything that I'm not supposed to with you. Um, I think we're all aware that the threat landscape is just getting worse. I mean, if you listen to, to podcasts, a particularly fun one, which I like, is Risky Business, which is an Australian podcast, and it goes through breach of the week. And yes, we live in very unsafe times, so it is important to build out a modern security stack if you are anybody who has got any IP because they are coming after you, whether it's criminals or whether it's state actors, uh, it's just bad out there. Um, before I joined Corelight, I had just no idea how paranoid I should be, and now I'm suitably paranoid because it's bad out there. So I think we're all aware of this. So. When we look at traditional security stacks, so what people have built, so firewalls, IDS systems, lots of stuff has been built to protect the perimeter of an organization. Uh, and they all generate logs, which is great because you've got all this log data, so my endpoint security, my firewalls, my IDS, they all generate logs, and then you pull them into a, a, into a back end, and that could be, I'm going to do a demo with Humio Engine, a Danish company, awesome, awesome tech. Uh, there are other vendors out there like Splunk and Elastic, Elk, etc. So lots of logs being pulled into big data lakes, so into a SIM or SIEM, or whatever you want to call it. Uh, the problem is that there's not much context. There's lots of data, but it's really hard to find. So the kind of data that we get from customers, that how long does it take when you have a breach or you've got a suspected breach, you've seen something unusual, so your endpoint has thrown an alert, somebody has told you it's about something, my IDS system has flagged something. Uh, how long does it take to actually figure out whether you have been breached, which you probably have, um, and how bad it is, so you know, how, how widespread is the, the malware um, and uh, breach. And the typical number that we get is it's about three or four hours that it takes to go through all of these different logs, which means that for a security analyst, it's an absolute pain in the face. It's just really tedious work. Uh, wouldn't it be better that we could, wouldn't it be great if we could do something better? And this is obviously why I'm here to talk to you about it. So Bro, or Zeek, um, is a packet sniffing technology that at wire speed, and this is a super cool thing, at wire speed looks at every single packet, uh, a core light appliance up to say 40 gigabits per second on a single appliance, and then we generate security metadata. So we actually look at every single transaction, we look at every single packet. So we don't, for example, just look at port 80 or port 443 and say that is HTTP, that's SSL. We actually look at it no matter what port number it's on. So stuff that's actually masquerading inside, often command and control for malware, is SSL encrypted, TLS encrypted, but hiding in something else. We actually look at every single packet, do deep packet analysis on every single packet at wireline, and then generate logs. And boy, do we generate logs. You know, that's 50 to 70 terabytes of data per day that we're pushing into a backend. It's rich data. Now, 
that pales into insignificance compared to packet capture. So I'll talk about that in a minute. How do we compare to packet capture? So we've got 50 protocol analyzers that run on every bit of traffic that we see, and we generate logs and push them back out into, the, into that back end. And as I said, that back end could be a sim. It could also be a data lake and applying machine learning. Now, that's a wide area. We could be here for hours and hours talking about the applicability of machine learning to security. It's applicable in some places and not in others, but there are some quite, quite interesting things that people are doing with bro data, machine learning, and statistical analysis. So the result of deploying bro in your environment is making it 20 times faster in instant response. So there's two things in security. So it's instant response. This is where something bad happens. You know something bad has happened, and you have to figure out you know, what happened, who's infected, how do I fix it, and there's threat hunting. And threat hunting is an exercise that security teams do on a regular basis, which is basically to look through the data that you've got and look for anomalies. So don't wait for something bad, an indicator, an IOC. God, we love our acronyms, don't we, vendors? And, um, but that's the industry term, so an indi indicator of compromise. So don't just wait for that. Actually take a look at your environment and look for anomalies, because once you understand your environment, you can see something that looks strange. So an example is uh, for the region of southern uh, Denmark. Um, they're talking about, well, if we just take a look at traffic patterns, and if I start to see a psychiatric nurse accessing a payroll system, that is something strange going on. Now, they, that may not be malware. It may actually just be bad intent by somebody, or it could be just somebody doing something by accident. So being able to actually get that data allows you to do both incident response and threat hunting. And just making it faster for security teams, removing false positives is basically what our tool set is here for. So this is the kind of classic, what happens when an IDS alert fires? So you're running something like Snort or Circada or... Uh, source fire, so you know, insert favorite IDS platform here. So you get an alert. How do I go figure out what's going on? Or it could be my malware, malware on my endpoint. So I could be running Silence or another EDR. As, we, as I said, we love acronyms. Um, so I get an alert as an analyst. Where, where do I go? So I basically start looking at firewall logs. I follow this pattern then maybe through web server logs. I then go and say, hey, I've got packet capture because part of my security stack was I thought that the best way of looking at security is by capturing every single packet and writing it to disk. Uh, hint, that's not the right way to do things. I came from a packet capturing background. And if you store eight gigabits per second of bandwidth, so eight gigs, and you try and store it on disk, you will get about seven days if you've got about if you've got 1.2 petabytes of storage, which is a lot of storage, trying to search that, do anything with it is completely useless. Um, I'll give a scenario later. I was working with a large bank in Australia in my previous life. They said we've got a problem with X509 certificates, uh, so expiring certificates and also certificates with SHA1 hashes. We just don't know enough about our SSL certs. They've been deployed forever. We've got thousands of certs, and uh, I was involved in a project where we used packet capture to go and try and analyze that. Now, it's, it worked, but it took two weeks of professional services to go and take packet captures, take bundles of them off, run T-Shark, which is Wireshark um, command line, and do this in a batch process. That's just not a lot of fun and kind of tedious. So what we do with the Bro technology, and as I said, Corelight, we have a commercial version, I'm, I'll talk about that in a bit, is we just make it faster for instant response. We give you a tool set to be able to look for indicators of compromise, look for command and control, look for malware inside SSL and TLS. Because that's one question that comes up a lot is, what about the fact that of, you know, with traffic moving to SSL and TLS, do you lose, you, do you lose visibility? And the answer is twofold. Uh, actually, we get great visibility from, from Bro, Zeek, uh, on uh, X509 certificates, and there's a lot of interesting things that we can do, and I'll talk about a thing called JA3, which is fingerprinting TLS, um, TLS clients and how that fits in. So basically, we give a tool set that allows instant responders, security teams, to just make their jobs easier. So this is an interesting slide um, from an organization called Applied Network Defense. Uh, I'm sure many of you would have heard of SANS Institute who do security training. So SANS Institute... Um, they very often talk about using Bro for threat hunting and incident response. Uh, interestingly, uh, uh, the US military, when they do uh, red team and uh, blue team exercises, 
uh, they actually use Bro uh, for the blue team. So there's a, uh, if you take a look at the BroCon 2017, there's quite a good presentation uh, from the US military about how they actually do their, so the NSA go up against cadets from other agencies and do red team, blue team. And when teams use Bro, they, they actually have to use the, the more, more secret stuff to try and, and continue to breach. So that's, um, it, as I said, it's very prevalent. And this is um, a marking by uh, Applied Network Defense, so Chris Sanders. He talks about rating you know, from A to B to C, like your you know, university exams. So A is obviously great, F is not. And he talks about the different sources of data. So you've got NetFlow. So NetFlow is really easy to, to get from routers or routers, whatever you call them, uh, from switches, from firewalls. So very lightweight traffic information. The problem is it doesn't have any depth. It's got no layer seven information. It's got very little context. On the other side of things that I talked about was packet capture. So PCAP, um, large blobs of data going onto disk, expensive, really hard to work with. Yes, it's got all the data there. So if you want to get very forensic, there is a place in, in security stacks. We don't say that, that PCAP is not important, but customers of ours who have deployed, um, so this actually came from a gentleman from one of the large uh, global oil companies based in Amsterdam, and he said, I haven't touched my packet capture in, in six months. He said, all my data comes from the Corelight appliance and the Bro slash Zeek data. So that rating there, you'll see that uh, Bro is rated as A, 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 and then C for acquisition. So acquisition is basically, how difficult is it to build your own bro, maintain it, try and scale it to multi gigabits per second and patch it, et cetera? Uh, the answer is, it is quite difficult. Now, if you are Amazon and you're used to building servers, uh, maintaining large fleets, thousands of instances, uh, orchestration, et cetera, then you know, open source bro is fine for you. Um, uh, but a lot of large enterprises, they just don't want to do this. So that's why the rating there says C. And we as Corelight of the commercial side, um, an enterprise side of Bro, Zeek, uh, we allow you to just basically have a turnkey appliance that you plug in and you get all this yummy goodness. A um, couple of comments there. So a fellow Irishman left-hand side, Connor Power. So he is one of the security leads at Amazon and they make extensive use of Bro data inside their environment. And he talks about, he's actually got a, a couple of very good presentations on uh, our YouTube channel. So if you take a look at Bro and YouTube, you'll find it there. Uh, his stat is that it took them about 18 months to build you know, version one, and then took another X months to build version two of their stack to try and scale an appliance. So they do all the hard work that, um, you know, Amazon can afford to do. Uh, we Corelight just for people who want this kind of data, we just give you a solution that you can plug into your network very easily. Um, so right-hand side, I talked a little bit about, hey, we just make things faster for security responders. Uh, the number here actually uh, 100X smaller than PCAP, that's actually not true. It's higher. So, because one question is when I want to size an impl implementation of Bro slash Corelight sensors, I have got this amount of bandwidth that I've got coming in, and I'm basically sniffing. And how big are the logs that go into the back end? So, how do I size my back end? How do I size Humio? How do I size Elk, et cetera? Um, the actual stat is that it's about 200x. So, you basically take whatever the ingest rate is, and you basically shrink it down by 1 200th. In a lot of environments, it's actually 1 400th. Now, one of the cool things that we can do with the Corelight sensor, you can't do it open source Bro, but the Corelight sensor is that you can drop in without even connecting to your back end. You can just drop it in, it'll generate the logs and actually give you all the log volumes in the UI. So you can say, I, I think I need this data inside my environment. How do I need to scale my logging back end? Do I have enough in terms of licensing or IOPS, et cetera, et cetera? We can do that by just dropping an appliance in. So, this is a little bit of the innards. I'm just going to talk briefly about this. Um, so out of the box, Bro slash Zeek inside a Corelet sensor uh, generates these 50 logs. Now that's the out of the box experience. The other part of this, the 25 years behind development of Bro and the open source community is that there's lots of people out there using this side of it, the programming language. So it's an event-based system that allows you to do things beyond what we do with the, the standard logs that our protocol parsers generate. You can also build your own protocol parser. So if you are really hardcore, and in fact, Universal, um, a region of southern Denmark are building a DICOM parser. 
because they do a lot of medical imaging that they're sending around, they want to be able to get additional metadata about DICOM imaging. So you can build your own protocol parsers. We even have a, a language, a thing called BINPAC, which is moving across to a thing called SPICY, that just makes it a bit easier to do all this stuff. Again, if you want all of those in-depth details uh, covered in Brocon, I'm not going to get to the demo in a couple of minutes. So programming language. So it allows you to do something like this. So basically tag VLAN information in the logs. A use case for this, we've got one uh, government department in the US, and they actually want in all of the logs, they want to be able to see which VLAN associated with each individual IP address and users, they want to actually have VLAN information, because they have a lot of segregation of VLANs for security reasons. So when an analyst looks at a log inside the back end, they don't want to have to basically hop from here to here. One of the big things in the security response world is the swivel chair, where you have to go from one system to another system to another. So enriching data and having as much data as possible in the one place that you look at it is very important. So this is the script. There's a few more lines, but it's not extensive. The script to actually uh, do VLAN tagging is extremely easy. So it's an event-based, um, uh, closely typed language. Uh, lots of examples. We even have a sandbox. So in, on the bro.org, which, which translates to zeek.org as well. Um, there's actually a sandbox environment. You can build scripts and run them there. You don't even need to build Bro yourself. If you want to build a script and test it out, you can even load PCAP files in, run them against it up in that environment. So you don't need any client installed. Just basically go to bro.org. You can actually test your own code. And here's some examples. So this is a core light sensor. Uh, we've got so best of breeds of these, uh, or probably the, you know, the, the top 10 most useful scripts that exist out there, and we prepackage them and we ship them with our appliance. We also do some, not just sanity checking, we also do some cleaning up because the open source community is great, but it doesn't guarantee quality. That's one of those things. Do you know that somebody who's written a script that it's actually efficient? So we've got one of those scripts at the moment that we are rewriting because we found performance-wise uh, it's, a, it's not very well written. So Seth Hall, one of the, the core developers of Bro, went through this one of these scripts and said it's actually the long connection script. So, so it's not particularly, it came from the open source. Uh, we're rewriting that to just make it more efficient. Because when you're trying to do that at 40 gigabits per second, it's, the way it's written is just not good. But some interesting ones here. I talked about VLANs. So SSL expiring certificates. Remember that use case I talked about with that bank in Australia? Well, rather than doing that horrible process of two weeks of taking packet captures, imagine just running a script that tells you, oh, by the way, your certs are expiring within 30 days. Wouldn't that be something good that you knew about so you can talk to your infrastructure team? Um, this one here, the malware hash registry. So just automatically just looking at files as they pass by and we see all files and actually matching them against malware registries. You can do it at the back end, so in something like Humio Engine. You can do it with a thing called the intelligence feeds, which I'll cover off, or you can do it in a script basis. So that's pretty interesting. And this one here, so JA3, strange name, but it comes from Salesforce. So salesforce.com, SFDC, they use Bro extensively inside their infrastructure for um, their security operations. Uh, one of the challenges as things move to TLS, so SSL encrypted, is if I can't see inside the traffic, how do I find malware? How do I find command and control? How do I find weirdness? So this is a bit of research that was done by two, sorry, three gents who all have the initials JA. What are the chances? So that's why it's called JA3. So the approach is take a look at the TLS client initiation, the client hello. So when a client goes to connect to an SSL backend, the client side advertises the ciphers and a whole bunch of information. What, the way that it's, it's built by a developer is very different to what Safari does compared to Firefox, compared to other browsers, compared to different agents that use TLS. They all actually have very different in terms of the headers. They look very different. You can actually distill all of those headers down, hash them down to a 32-character hash, which is called a JA3 hash. So there's now an industry um, initiative. Uh, and if you go and take a look at abuse.ch, you'll see all of the JA3 hashes for known good and known bad. So things like Metasploit, et cetera, if they are inside your environment by using JA3, you can actually match and find that even though it's SSL encrypted, this is bad stuff. You can also whitelist your own because you may have developed your own things in-house. So you can whitelist your own stuff and say, this is my known stuff based on a JA3 hash. So very interesting. And also, if you, if you really love SSL and TLS, 
This survives TLS 1.3, because one of the things about TLS 1.3 is that the certificates themselves get encrypted. Uh, the SNI is in clear text, but that may get encrypted in the future. So TLS 1.3 is an, is an interesting, it, it, it poses challenges for lots of things in the security space, but JA3, because the TLS client hello is before it start TLS, that's still extremely valuable and useful. Um, okay, I'm going to move on, right. Uh, enterprise grade, so basically, uh, Corelight, how do we fit in, what is it that we do? We basically give an out of the box uh, enterprise grade version of Bro. Full UI, full management, scales up to 40 gigabits per second, hardened, has an on-box firewall. Uh, you can't mess with the box because, like as I said about Bro, with you know, this responsibility of getting all of this rich data that you've sent to a sensor, you do not want that compromised. You do not, because it would be a great honeypot for people to be able to access. So scale and security and just easy deployment. It literally, look, every vendor says, hey, you just plug it in and it works. But um, I have done very little travel in the eight months that I've been with Corelight in Europe. Um, I've moved from Australia. Uh, I spend very little time on planes. We just send stuff to people and um, it works. So, uh, as I said, uh, the team behind Open Source Bro are all employees of Corelight, and what we do is that basically we give back to the open source community. So, 20% of their time is, is developing for open source. We actually have two people on staff who we, uh, you know, are fully paid for by Corelight, and they are just open source. They do nothing except open source, nothing to do with the commercial side of things. So, this is how we continue to keep, um, uh, you know, advancing uh, Bro, Zeek in the in open source uh, and maintain the other side of things. So, um, how do we deploy? So, where do we fit into your network infrastructure? So, we go behind some form of packet aggregator, typically. So, that could be Ixia, Gigamon, Garland, lots and lots of other Arista. Uh, we can use span ports. So, if you're doing it at small scale testing, you can do a mirror port of a switch. Tends not to be a great idea at production because switches run uh, span ports and mirrors at low priority, so they actually drop packets under load. Um, there are, I'll, if, you, if you catch me for coffee, I'll tell you which are the very bad switches. I can tell you which are the ones you definitely don't want to do span ports. So most people are using a packet aggregator and taps to get the traffic and send it into us. So we're part of a stack. You may still have packet capture going on there, but then you've basically got us taking packets and then sending it into the back end. So obviously I made the Humio Owl logo bigger because we're talking about the Humio demo today, but you may have you know, multiple back ends. Now, interestingly, us, in the um, commercial side, Corelight, we've got the ability to send data into multiple backends. We can actually do what we call fork and forward, which says that I want to send some data into my SIM. I want to send some of it into a data lake for machine learning. And there's an interesting project out there, because we're talking about open source, called RITA, or ITA. So what RITA does is take bro logs, Zeek logs, uh, for a long period of time. So you need to have at least a week, like at least a month, and then on onwards, and do statistical analysis looking for malware, looking for command and control, because um, there's an idea of beaconing. So malware sitting on your PC uh, has, got to, has got to basically phone home. It's got to go back to its command and control to maybe just be told to do something, to uh, download a new package, uh, to send data back. Well, that's data exfiltration. So you can actually use statistical analysis on large data sets to look for, you know, if I'm seeing regular or very small connections or connections going, so a lot of connections going to a small cluster of IP addresses that's just appeared. That's something anomalous. So there's a, there's a project called Rita, and we've got a number of customers who take data, pull it into their system, and also pulled it into Rita. There are other learn, uh, machine learning engines such as PatternX. There's um, Apache, so Apache's hyper, um, cyber ACP, um, cyber, cyber platform, um, that basically takes large data sets of bro data and will we'll use machine learning on it to augment what analysts are doing. And then importantly down here is this extracted files. So we have the ability to take every single file that we see, so whether it's coming via email, SMTP, FTP, file transfers in the Microsoft protocol. So we've got a full SMB parser up to SMB 3.1, which is the latest version. We can extract every single file and push it into a file analysis framework. So that's something like an, a malware detection, a malware sandboxing. So there's open source uh, solutions such as uh, Cuckoo. There are commercial you know, ones such as um, uh, FireEye, et cetera. So the ability to do that at high speed and high scale. So some of our customers are extracting 15,000 files an hour and pushing it into a malware detection and we can do that at wire speed by just click box on the Corelight sensor and pointing it there. Right. 
Um, sizing, um, you'll get a copy of these decks, I won't belabor this point. So sizing, you can consume a core light sensor from you know, a little, little virtual VM down to 200 megabits per second up to an appliance that does, it says 25 gigs per second on the AP3000. That'll actually scale up to uh, 40 gigs using hardware offload. So we've got um, FPGA NICs, so field programmable gate array NICs that we can download logic onto and do some clever stuff. So see me for a coffee and I'll tell you about that. Right, demo time. We've got about 10 minutes. Um, so do I do a live demo or do I do a recorded demo? I'm thinking... Uh, oh yeah, I, I end up kind of... Okay, well, I might do a compromise on this, right? I, so I recorded this in my hotel room earlier, not knowing whether Wi-Fi, oops, Wi-Fi would work. So Wi-Fi does work. So I'll start with the recorded one because otherwise I end up kind of like tapping away at a keyboard, which is just, I don't know, it's a little bit of the man behind the curtain, you know? So, um, right, so the demo that we're doing is one of our demos, core light demo systems. So this is not our production network because this is bad stuff. So what we've done is we've, we use Ixia traffic generators. We take, um, what, you know, known bad, PCAPs, so um, capture the flag exercises that basically, you know, malware, et cetera, and we, we feed that through a sensor and we push it into a Humio en engine instance. So let me get going. So I love this. I love the Humio. I got a, had to start with that. I could, I could have left that bit out, but I do, I do love that log on. So Creston, the CTO, is sitting up there. I'd never get rid of that, please. I, I, I love that. Right. So what we're doing here is we're just taking a look at this particular sensor, and we've got lots of logs. So we're just going to filter and say, okay, group by path, which is basically the log names. And then we see there's a whole bunch of logs, like DNS, because we're looking at all that traffic and extracting DNS logs. So there's nothing coming from, so this is the you know, man behind the curtain. There's no, no you know, trickery here. There's no firewall logs, endpoint logs. This is all coming from the core light sensor, you know, bro, looking at, at wire data and generating logs. Okay. So something bad happened. So my business doc, 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 my endpoint or my IDS said something bad has happened here. So I take a look at my logs and I see, okay, Intel. So the Intel is the intelligence framework. So we can actually take in feeds from things like CrowdStrike to look at bad, you know, known bad URLs, known bad IP addresses, MD5 hashes, JA3. So what we're seeing here is that we actually ourselves on the sensor have flagged and said, my business doc is bad domain. So it didn't need to just come from IDS. We're also, we're, we're basically doing this. So in your backend, like your Humio engine, you would typically have an alert that says, if something appears in the Intel log, tell me about it, because this is not good. So as I said, there's a number of Intel feeds that we can take, open source, uh, free available, and things like CrowdStrike, et cetera. So this particular user, HTTP, they were downloading some stuff, and it's f7.gif, and it has been detected as being an executable. Now, a GIF file that's an executable is not something good. So, and by the way, we detect that as an executable by looking at the packets. We don't just look at the MIME type. So we had this thing downloaded, f7.gif, and what I'm going to do is take a look at what's called the UID, the unique ID. We actually stitch every single connection together because, say, for a web transaction, there's DNS lookups, there's multiple HTTP connections that pull stuff down. So we group them together under a UID. So I'm searching on the UID. And I'm looking actually at the connection log. So the con log is very interesting because it's a bit like NetFlow on steroids. It tells me all about that connection right through the flow from you know, start to end in terms of tracking TCP connection state. So TCP connection state and the history of connection state. And if we jump up, because it's funny, I know what's going to happen next because I recorded this earlier. Um, and you look at the bro Zeek documentation, they tell you, it'll tell you about um, you know, TCP flags. So, S0 is important, because we're going to do this as a demo later, is TCP uh, sin sent and no response back. So that is usually an indicator of scanning. And then this uh, history field allows us to look at things like um, for performance, actually not just security, I can track a connection and see if I'm seeing lots of um, TCP window zero, that means the server is too busy. So you can actually get some very detailed, not just security data, you can actually use this for performance and for um, uh, troubleshooting. So the conversation I had this morning um, with Southern Region of Denmark said, you know, this is part of the, what we're doing, we're actually using this network data with the ops teams as well as security teams. So the f7.gif, we've analyzed that file and we've actually generated MD5 hashes plus SHA-256 and SHA-1. So if I take a look at that file, my typing was not so super because I hadn't had my coffee. 
and I just go and pumped it into virus total, it'll say, well, that doesn't look very good, does it? So we've matched, and that was without even extracting it into a file extraction framework. That was just what we do on the fly all the time with every single file that we see. We generate these uh, MD5 hashes for every file. If you use the scripts that I talked about, we can detect whether it's malware. We can also detect the back end in Humeo Engine. Right, so something bad happened, as I said. So that file is bad. Now. Let me take a look at what's happening with that client. So, okay, let's look at what the DNS lookups that that client is doing. So if you were paying attention, it was dot .53 was the IP address there. So I'm saying, okay, path DNS, and look at the source IP address of 53, and then let's group it by the query. Because what we're looking for is indications of DNS exfiltration. So DNS is often used to leak data out by malware to send it back. So if I basically you know, sort that, I see standard Windows stuff, Facebook, but down the bottom there's owned.se. So, you know, those Swedes. Mm. Anyway, so um, that will basically show you, you know, DNS exfiltration, so that I'm seeing that from that client. So now, malware rarely hits one single you know, workstation. It's usually, um, it hits others. So let's look for um, lateral movement. So we talked about that S0. So let's look for that client trying to connect to other hosts, because that's what malware will typically do. So what I'm saying is, show me all connections with S0, so that means a TCP SYN sent, but nothing sent back, and group them by origin ID. And then we'll sort. So you'll see dot .53 is there, but hey, there's a whole bunch of other ones there. So 54, 128 are also doing a lot of lateral movement. So it means I've got a problem that I need. it's not just one workstation. I've got four or five that I need to take a look at. Um, Let's look at DNS exfiltration across the whole environment. So this is a longer string, so I just shoved it into a saved query. And it says, uh, show me all DNS queries that are long. Well, basically, just, just group them, because DNS queries should really be about 60 characters or less. So the kind of DNS queries I'm seeing is a whole bunch of non-readable. And then it's, it's, I can see that's at least two addresses. And that dot .30, that 10.30, I had not seen before. So, that is some badness there that shows that I've got some uh, DNS exfiltration happening. So let's go to, I'll jump to dashboards in a minute. Okay, so that Intel file that I talked about and JAR3. Okay. So if I search on the Intel file and I say, show me something that matches on JAR3. So a hit on JAR3 matching some, some bad some marked bad JAR3. So I just switch it to JSON format. And you will see there is that 32 character JAR3 fingerprint that has matched because of the Intel feed that's going into my sensor. And I can then use that to go, you know, use a number of, of different databases, such as abuse.ch, that I can get to. Um, OK, dashboards. Let's get to dashboards then. Okay, so we have built in Humio some useful dashboards, so you don't have to just do queries. So we talked about um, DNS. So up on the top right, count by non-existence. So if I'm seeing lots of DNS going to un unusual places, that's going to be an indicator to me that there is something possibly bad inside my environment. Um, looking at HTTP, so let's look at what HTTP agents, so um, what browsers, if I know my environment, if I know that I've got a, a standard mixture of um, user agents and I'm seeing some rare, unusual agents, that may be that I've got some, some malware. It may be, you know, it's just something that I didn't know about that is legitimate, but it allows me to just from a dashboard view to, to, to get to that information. The Intel framework. So again, just tell me about, from a dashboard view, uh, matches that I'm getting against those, um, those intelligence framework or malware feeds, bad IP addresses, known bad MD5 hashes, known bad JAR3. Uh, ah, and this use case here, let's get to, yes, X509. So cert expiry and rare subjects. So if you are seeing 
unusual X509 certificates, that often points to the fact that you have got malware that's basically using command and control inside TLS, SSL encrypted traffic. And this is just through a dashboard view. Now, I don't go into the whole alerting, but alerting is very important because with Humio Engine and others, you can build alerts that say, if something unusual has happened, send me an alert in different interesting ways. So Humio allows you to do things like Slack channel integration. So you could have a Slack channel that basically pushes some stuff down into to say to your security team, you need to go take a look at this. Um, you can also do integration with um, you know, orchestration engines like Phantom, for example. You could say, if I am seeing DNS traffic that looks like DNS exfiltration, I want to change my firewall rule on my Palo Alto firewall so that it blocks that traffic from that, from that client. So you can do a lot of interesting integration with the, with the back end with alerting. Um, just looking at time. Uh, I, can, I can jump on some other demos, but let me just, let me just I think questions and answers are probably good time-wise. Are, are you nodding at me? Is that? Eight minutes, okay, cool. Um, so just back to talking about the open source community and how we continue to support the open source. By the way, was that, was that useful? Yeah, okay, good. Um, so supporting the open source community, uh, there is a Zeek workshop. If for those in the audience who do actually use bro slash Zeek or are considering deploying it inside your environment, um, this is happening in April 2019. And I am definitely interested because it's at CERN and you get to do a, turn t a tour of the Large Hadron Collider. So that's a kind of a bonus to turning up at the Zeek workshop in April 2019. Um, and we're obviously providing uh, funding support for that open source initiative. Um, and questions and answers, if you have been typing them in, Helena's got her, her, her. Yeah, thank you. Let's give a hand first. <laughs>